Welcome to Extension Connection on Super Talk 1270. Thoughtful information and discussion with experts from both Burley and Morton County Extension Service offices. Extension Connection provides advice on family nutrition, issues in agriculture, lawn and garden, community leadership, flood recovery, homeowner concerns, and so much more. Live from the Super Talk 1270 News Studio, this is Extension Connection. Good morning and welcome to the Extension Connection. This is Jackie Buckley, Morton County Extension Agent, and we have the Morton County staff here today, and we are live in the studio. Um, we skipped out lot two weeks ago because we were all at the we were all at the fair, and so um, we had our program taped. Um, and so ha I have with me today Ashley Stegman, Morton County Extension Agent in Training, and Vanessa Hoynes, Family and Consumer Science Agent. Um, Ashley, what are you going to visit with us about today? Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, some of those tomato issues that we may be seeing um, coming up uh, soon as our tomatoes are starting to ripen, some of the uh, diseases that we could be seeing. And then also I will be uh, touching on uh, the, our U.S. meat uh, market and uh, what effects have happened in the last uh, week or so. And then lastly, I'm just going to share something interesting that I found, um, some new technology used in agriculture. Okay, and how about you, Vanessa? Well, I have some upcoming programs I'm going to talk about. Uh, babysitting clinic coming up next week that we still have some slots open. And then a uh, nourisher digestive system program that will be coming up in the next few weeks. And then I thought we should also get started and talk a little bit about a little bit more about canning and uh, food preservation in general. So if you have some questions, you're welcome to call in about that later. Um, and then I thought we'd look at one of those popular vegetables that we might have in our garden or start seeing at the farmer's markets, the onion. And you don't, you don't eat them, do you? I eat them a little. They're not my big favorite. They're not my favorite, but they are a big favorite. Okay. All right. Because I know she won't eat them on a patty melt. No, oh. no. I don't like them on, I don't like them on patty melts. <laughs> um, and I'm going to visit with you about some of the Morton County Fair results, um, flowering bulbs for North Dakota. And some of the things, um, what are those dead circles in your lawn? And then also preventing insect problems in grain bins. And so, and I've got other things too, and we'll see what we have time for. I thought those dead circles in your lawn was just the neighbor's dog. Well, it could be. <laughs> that could be. <laughs> yes, and that is one of the causes sometimes. And sometimes you have people that are walking their dog mm -hmm. and they're in your lawn. So and it you might not be your neighbor. It, it might, might not be somebody be. further away. Yes, yeah. it mm -hmm. could be. Don't draw the conclusion. You know, and I guess I've really seen a lot of people... Um, being very courteous as far as when they're walking their dog and having a, a bag with them. And I think that's a very nice thing to do to make sure that um, your dog isn't um, relieving himself um, on somebody's lawn and then they have to pick up after them. So that's mm -hmm. a nice thing. I've noticed that. Um, it's not really a present. No, it's yeah. not. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's start with um, some of the Morton County Fair results. Um, I forgot my 4-H results um, at the office because I printed a new sheet, but I can give you some of the open class awards. Um, Sierra Ellingson from St. Anthony had champion cow-calf pair with her Angus heifer, Angus cow, and she also had champion cow-calf pair in the 4-H division as well. Yep. Um, Kristen Dahl had the champion Charlay heifer, and Kristen was our champion senior beef showman. And then also, I think she had reserve champion heifer in the 4-H division. I'll remember, try and remember what, what I can here. <laughs> Riley Kuhn had champion Hereford heifer. Peyton Sunsbach from Delax had the champion Red Angus heifer. Courtney Schaff had champion Angus heifer both days, Friday and Saturday. Yep. And then she was uh, supreme heifer also both, both, days. both days. Right, Ashley? Yes, and so, right. yep, she had did really well. And so that's a clean sweep. Yes, it was what you call a clean sweep. <laughs> a triple crown. And Courtney <laughs> is from St. Anthony, um, daughter of Kelly and Marty Jo Schaff. Taylor Gaynor from McCluskey had the champion shorthorn heifer. Preston Cargo had the champion Shorthorn Plus Heifer. Kendra Myers from Catherine had champion Simmental Heifer. And her sister Kylie had the champion Sim Influenced Heifer. And both of those girls had a, another clean sweep by winning the overall showmanship 
contest in both the junior and the senior division. Oh, and Congratulations. Yes, and Kylie has won it two years in a row, and there's an awful big trophy that she wants to win <laughs> one more time next year. And she's Because she told me that after she won it that um, they, ha- they have a perfect place for it in their home. So we'll see <laughs> if she comes back next year because you have to win it three years in a row mm-hmm. to, to win it. Well, positive, positive yes. attitude yes. helps a lot. Yes, and Jamie Lundquist from Hampton had the champion commercial heifer, reserve champion steer, Cade e- Erickson. Um, he is from Bismarck. And then Taylor Philippeck from McCluskey had the champion steer. And the champion junior beef showman like I, and was Kylie Junior Beef. And, um, excuse me, Kendra was champion junior beef showman with Kylie being the senior beef showman. Jess Sanders from Elmont had champion Dairy Goat. Lanny Sunsbach from Hazen, reserve champion Dairy Goat. Jamie Geyer, champion Meat Goat from Lisbon. Preston Cargo, reserve champion Meat Goat, and Preston is from Minot. Thomas Fries from New Salem, champion Breeding Goat. Maya McCowan, champion Senior Meat Goat Showman, and Maya is from New Salem, from, excuse me, Mandan. Brooke Kunz from New Salem, champion junior meat goat showman. Jess Sanders won several awards, um, champion dairy goat showman as well. Maya, Maya McCowan, champion senior dairy goat showman. Lindsay Galbraith from Enderlin was the champion junior sheep showman and the junior swine showman in the open class division. Um, Laura Dukeshire from Balfour was the jun- champion senior swine showman, champion poultry, Kristen Johnson, and she's from Burley County. Jake Sanders, champion doe in the um, rabbit division. Rachel Smith, uh, Schmidt, excuse me, Schmidt from Center, champion buck. Kiera Papka, best decorated stall in the horse division. And Kiera also took several awards in the 4-H Horse Show on Thursday as well. Al Hankey from New Salem had the champion all-breeds draft horse. Brooke Hendrick, Heinrich excuse me, had the champion western pleasure horse. Cheyenne Quizzle, champion pony gelding. Esther Granis, champion pony stallion. Samantha Johnson, champion pony mare. Brooke Heidrick, champion gelding. Morgan Heidrick. Champion Mayor, Jamie Schmidt, Champion Stallion, Nicole Golddaddy from Bismarck, Champion Old Timer Showman, Samantha Johnson, Champion Junior Horse Showman, and Shelby Malski was the Senior Horse Showman on Open Class Day. And so that's just some of our vo- results. Our 4 H results will be um, published very soon in the Morton County papers. I think that the support staff is working on those and we'll get those um, published very soon. Um, We're getting the cue that it's time to go for the break, and we'll be back. Call us at 663-1270. We're here live in the studio if you have any questions about what we're talking about today. And we'll talk to you again after the break. Right now it's 75. Your news leader. Weeknights at 6 and 10. Super Talk 1270. Welcome back to the Extension Connection. This is Jackie Buckley, Morton County Extension Agent, and I'm going to kick it over to Ashley Stegman, and she's going to talk a little bit about tomatoes and some garden information. Thank you, Jackie. Um, As Jackie said, I'm going to be talking about some tomatoes, uh, rotten tomatoes. We, uh, of course, we all hate to go into our garden and see those tomatoes that just aren't going to make it. Um, there are nine uh, types of uh, findings that you, that are potential to see in your garden. Um, a very popular one, and I actually just experienced this myself, is blossom end rot. I had a few tomatoes that um, they ripened, they looked nice, and the bottoms of them just there was no bottom there. They were black. And of course, my husband goes, he pulls it out and brings it to me and is like, what is this? What's wrong with it? And um, from looking this up, I found out what it is. It's caused by a calcium deficiency. Um, It's important to keep your soil evenly moist and to not damage the roots when you're cultivating and uh, mulch those vines. And the root system develops Uh, It finds calcium, ions, and the future fruits should be fine. 
Um, you may have a couple fruits that um, have that black end rot on them, but uh, other other future fruits should not be harmed by this. A few uh, other findings that might you might uh, find in your garden is uh, cracking of the tomatoes and this is caused by a rapid growth of fruits and it's often due to the lack of rain um, in a drought time and the cracks may become infected uh, it's important to mulch your plants uh, to ma maintain that uniform moisture condition and then um, there's also certain varieties that are more resistant than others. Uh, another uh, possible uh, finding that you may see in your garden with your tomatoes is uh, a tomato fruit worm. And these are pretty, uh, they're pretty much like a corn ear worm. And um, the larva, they'll hatch from white eggs on the vine and then they will go to feed on the foliage and they will then tunnel into those fruits. And in August, uh, next July or August, if you're in your, your gardens and you're, you're seeing these little eggs, um, you wanna make sure that you are uh, removing those eggs and um, hopefully guarding your, your uh, fruit or, or your tomatoes from any of those uh, fruit worms. And uh, another findings that we could be seeing is sun is called sun scald. It's when you have a bleached white or tan area on your tomatoes and the spots become papery soft. And um, it's because it they're overexposed to the sun and they almost are getting somewhat of a sunburn, if you will. And um, it you want to make sure that you uh, have healthy vine growth by keeping insect pests and disease diseases away and then you want to avoid the excess pruning in in that in those circumstances um, another symptom that we have been seeing um, is early blight with tomatoes. Um, this is a dark leathery lesions that develop near the top of fruits and they're large irregular brown lesions uh, with rings and uh, even sometimes yellow margin that's develop into foliage. The foliage. Um, you want to avoid overhead irrigation and then there are some um, some ways that you can protect your plants. Um, you you want to just make sure that you're avoiding any of that overhead irrigation. And and getting back to that blossom end rot. Now this isn't this isn't only in tomatoes. This can also be in peppers and zucchini. Um, again, the, the your future fruits will be fine. You just need to remove any of those um, plants that are affected with this uh, blossom end rot. Um, another issue that you may see is some bacterial speck or, or spots on some of your fruit. And usually those are tiny, dark, um, even sometimes raised specks that are on your your green and red fruits. And, and this will occur when uh, the temperatures dip, don't, dip down to the 60s or, or 70s. And, and with this week, we shouldn't have to worry about those low temperatures. It sounds like it's going to be warming up here and finally really feeling like summer. Um, but uh, some of those spots can develop even on the vines. And if you see them on the vine, just be very observant. Um, if they are beginning to attack some of your fruit, uh, you can spray copper to counteract some of that speck. And, and with the spot, uh, it, it's similar, but the spots become a little bit bigger and they're almost... Um, corky type of spots. They're embedded a little bit more and this occurs when the temps are a little bit warmer and again they can develop on the on the vines and you want to really avoid overwatering um, your garden and even working in your garden when it's wet because you can easily transfer some of that bacteria to other plants and other fruits that are that are growing. Um, a lot of our gardens are um, about a week to two weeks behind because of our, our late um, warm up, if you will. And so just keep the, these, uh, these um, findings in mind when you go into your garden and you see some of these um, 
fungus or some of these diseases happening, just remember there are uh, practices that you can counteract them. And um, also this morning I was on a, a statewide horticulture talk and uh, there was an individual talking about his sweet corn. Now, I have a neighbor that continually gets bags of sweet corn lately. And um, being that I'm not the individual receiving the sweet corn, I have to say I might be a little jealous um, <laughs> seeing all the sweet corn that's being delivered. Um, just remember that, you know, um, su sweet corn right now is um, it's a little early probably. So uh, you want to really wait and uh, pick those full ears with all the corn with all the kernels on. Um, if they're not, if if your stalks are not um, developing or, or yielding as many year, ears of corn, uh, just remember you you may you may be having a problem with excess nitrogen um, that can that can cause your stalks to be very green and, and full of foliage but um, it will delay <coughs> the fruit or the the flowering or the ears to really take off and grow um, and so that that could that can be a problem for some some individuals and um, just to remember that that nitrogen that pr promotes that leafy growth and and if you see or are worried that you might be having a deficiency in nitrogen um, if your leaves are are yellowing or, or becoming kind of a pale green color that uh, might be a sign of of a low um, levels of nitrogen and, and then also while talking nitrogen uh, phosphorus is very important to keep an eye on that and that's usually in, in your early part of the season um, we don't have to worry too much about that right now but some some um, just tell 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 signs for phosphor for abundance phosphorus is um, purple in color and um, the leaves will kind of take on a, a purple hue and um, this is because that phosphorus is, is less mobile than the nitrogen and that phosphorus takes a little bit more to um, transpire through the um, stalk itself. Um, and then another thing that we had talked about on our, our state horticulture talk was um, about leaves um, to, with some trees. We're seeing some trees that are starting to have leaf scourge and, and that's when there's brownie or when the leaves become brown on the margins and, and this typically happens to our young trees. They're, they're fighting a little bit harder to survive and, and they might have uh, stress that they're going through, especially with these high, high temperatures. Um, we just need to make sure that we are watering um, effectively and, and to make sure that they are getting enough water uh, deeply and thoroughly. For every inch diameter of the trunk, uh, you should be administering 10 gallons of water. So if you have a new young tree that was just planted this spring or, or even a year or two ago, you want to make sure that you're getting enough water to them. Uh, 10 gallons is a is a recommended amount and you make sure that you are getting it uh, deep enough and thorough enough to, uh, to the roots of the tree. Um, a lot of times when we transplant uh, trees or, or even shrubs, um, we're not getting enough water uh, to those trees that, uh, or to those roots that are required um, to grow. Um, and with that, I guess uh, we talked about quite a few different uh, findings that our tomatoes could be affected with. Um, there's uh, one more that I actually forgot. We don't, uh, I guess, see that as often, but that's anthracnosis. Um, that is a finding that means that you have a sunken, dark, round lesions um, on your tomatoes, and um, it, it almost has a pink spore look to it. And uh, these, the way to counter this type of um, fungus is you need to remove the infected fruits and avoid over overhead watering. A lot of these um, problems can be fixed by avoiding overhead watering and um, making sure that you don't water too much. And with that, I believe we'll be coming back and we'll be talking to Vanessa about nourishing your digestive system. Thank you.
Right now it's 75. You're never more than a few minutes from a weather update here on Super Talk 1270. Welcome back to the Extension Connection. Yours truly, Jackie Buckley, here this uh, this morning. Excuse me. And we're going to start off, um, and I'm going to kick it back to Vanessa. And she's going to talk about nourishing your di- di- digestive system. Boy, I'm having a hard time talking. Well, it's hard to say. <laughs> And then also something a little bit about onions and some canning. Yeah. So kind of have a smorgasbord, if you will, of things. Yeah. Um, Next week and the following week, I'll be doing some programs focusing on nourishing your digestive system. And digestive disorders are among the most common problems in healthcare today. In fact, um, that, that is one of the number one reasons why folks tend to visit their doctor. And so this is an opportunity to come learn a little bit more about what we can do to take care of our digestive system and um, things that, uh, that steps that we can take to just make a, and ease that, that system a little bit more. And so you can become a regular human being. And so we'll, we're going to be looking at doing a program on August 19th, which will be next Tuesday at 10 o'clock at Mandan Golden Age, and then 1 o'clock at Edgewood in Mandan on that same day on next Tuesday. And then the following week on August 25th, I'll be doing the program in the courthouse, so the public is open to come to any of these at 1030 and 130. And so you're welcome to call our, our office and register at 667-3340. And we'd love to have you come and join us and learn a little bit more about your digestive system and how to just feel a little bit better. I also have a program coming up next Monday on the 18th uh, for babysitters. So if you know any um, young person who is between 11 and 15 um, and would be interested in starting a babysitting business, this is an opportunity to come and learn some of the techniques and skills and and um, things that they need to know when they're in charge of other other little people. And it'll be on Monday, August 18th from 9.30 to 3. And this is, um, we still do have some openings, so please call 667-3340 if you're interested in registering. There is a registration fee of $25, um, so we will, um, at this point too, you, you'd be welcome to just bring that to the to the training on Monday, but we'd love to have some more join us. So if you know somebody between 11 and 15, we'd love to have you give us a call. Well, in thinking about what we're gonna talk about today on the radio, I've been getting more and more phone calls about food preservation and specifically um, focusing on canning. Of course, there's always lots of questions, lots of um, friends and neighborhood family recipes that are being shared and used and how come this isn't working and those kinds of things. And so just to kind of recap and bring people uh, some knowledge and and background information, many of us don't realize that until really the 1940s, um, there was no research done on food preservation. And so this is really a relatively new science in comparison to um, many of the other sciences that relate to food. And so that is why we do have changes that happen periodically, very frequently um, throughout as time passes. And so many of those recipes that maybe great grandmothers had or um, neighbors have that they've gotten from their relatives, even though we have had generations of relatives that survived and didn't have any problems with those, there still may be problems now because um, other things have changed. We know more about about food science. There's been more research done. And then sometimes the foods themselves change. For example, tomato varieties have changed. They have been bred to, to be less acidic, to appeal to our tastes when we're eating them raw. But that plays havoc with those recipes that we have for canning tomatoes necessarily because that acidic level is an important um, piece in making sure that we have safe products when we're do, when we're canning so just some general rules to be um, to be aware of when we're doing when we're canning and, and preserving foods is to use a pressure canner and always use the current USDA processing guidelines when you're canning low acid foods such as vegetables and meats and I know as as Ashley was talking I was thinking to myself yes we confuse people all the time 
because when she was talking about tomatoes, she was calling them a fruit. And they are the fruit of the plant. And so Ashley was correct in how she was speaking. But now I'm talking about eating them. And when we eat them, they become a vegetable. And so that can be very confusing. So yes, tomatoes are considered a vegetable. And so in some cases, we do need to pressure can them. Um, And then another way that we have worked with trying to make those tomato recipes more more uh, safe is to acidify tomatoes and that is recommended um, that you add one tablespoon of bottled lemon juice or per pint or um, citric acid or two tablespoons per quart and that would be to each one that you are that you are preparing as you're processing to be sure that those tomatoes have enough acidic level to be safe in doing the processing that you're doing. Um, also using research tested salsa recipes is really important and then um, taking those recipes and not altering those ingredient proportions at all. Um, you know many times um, in lots of different recipes I'll hear callers will say Oh, well, you know, I just add a few more carrots and I put a few more of this in and I do a few more of that. And and, and, and Jackie and Ashley are laughing because I, you know, when I get calls like this, I have to talk about it. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, I think, because in food preservation, it isn't um, a type of cooking that allows us to be creative. Food preservation is really more like a science experiment where you have to follow the recipe because it was designed that way to be safe and that those ratios between the different types of vegetables that you're putting in um, to something like a salsa or something that you're pressure canning is so important. And um, even if you're doing something in a boiling water bath, if you're adding other things in that are low acid, that can really cause havoc and make it something unsafe in the end. So if you are feeling creative or if you have a recipe that you really enjoy for salsa, for example, it is okay to use that recipe, but then please freeze it. If it isn't um, comparable or similar to any other recipe that you can find out there that has been tested, um, freezing is always an option. And I do encourage you to take those recipes that you have been using, uh, go to our website or come to um, our office or give us a call and I can sure um, send information out to you also. But compare our research tested recipes with the ones you have. And if they don't seem to, you know, sometimes you can find one that has similar uh, spices or flavoring or combinations that you think would be comparable to, to your former recipe. And then you can just shift over and use that new one. Um, Another thing that people sometimes aren't aware of is that we no longer uh, recommend using hot wax on the tops of our jams and jellies. It is recommended that you do a two-piece lid and and then do uh, processing for 10 minutes in our area. And so if you're looking for, those are just a few tips, but if you're looking for more food preservation resources, they are free of charge. In fact, I do have a display up in the entry of the courthouse right now. So if you are downtown and want to walk by in Mandan and and pick up some things, you can sure grab them there or give us a call or go to our website because we have lots of information available online that can help you out. And of course, you can always give us a call if you have a more specific question too. I also have some information about onions. And yes, Jackie was giving me a bad time because (laughs) no, they probably aren't my favorite vegetable, but um, they are a really popular vegetable and they do really bring a lot of flavor to our foods. They also bring vitamin C, fiber, and a lot of antioxidants. And sometimes I don't think we realize that onions are a healthy thing to eat. We just like them to add that flavor. And we also, I also found that we eat about 20 pounds of onions per year, each of us. Well, I know somebody's picking up my slack because I don't eat 20 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, onions have a few have a few downsides that people think of right away. And um, maybe, maybe the first one people think of is when I'm cutting them up, what happens? Start crying. You start mm-hmm. crying. And so I have some tips about that. Um, one thing that you can do to help uh, that tearful process not happen in your kitchen is to chill the onions about a half hour before you're planning to prepare them. Uh, Make sure you use a really sharp knife. 
And then make sure that you leave the root end intact. So in other words, um, cut off the top, peel the skin, and then start chopping from the top of the onion versus the root. The root end is actually where the sulfur compounds are concentrated, and that's the piece um, that makes us cry. And so that, that can be um, helpful. Another thing, too, is that if you have, if you have been having to cut up lots of onions, having some airflow, a fan, those kinds of things can also help in your, in your room that you're working in, in your kitchen. Um, another thing, another downside is sometimes bad breath. I hear about people going out to lunch with each other and, oh, I can't order that because I'm, you know. Um, one thing you can do is, well, make sure that everybody orders onions and then <laughs> hang with them for the rest of the day. Or parsley is a really good natural breath mint that can really help to get rid of some of that, that um, odor. Um, other things you might not realize about onions is that when you're choosing choosing those onions, there are different colors of onions, different kinds of onions that are good for different things. Um, usually the yellow onion is probably the all-purpose onion. White onions tend to have a real sharper flavor and, and retain their flavor more during cooking. And then those purple onions or red onions are really used more in raw, uh, in a raw state in salads because they are a little sweeter. And so when you're looking in the store and trying to decide, that would be some things to keep in mind. Um, when you're buying them in the grocery store or the farmer's market, be sure to look for firm and even colored um, without bruises. And so, um, you know, enjoy your onions, get out there and, uh, and have some fun. And maybe uh, another time we can talk a little bit more about harvesting and, and keeping them into the fall and winter because they do keep very well. And we're going to take a break and we'll be back in a few minutes with Extension Connection. Welcome to the Extension Connection, and we're back, and we are live in the studio today. So if you have any questions, please please feel free to call us at 663-1270. Or if you're bashful and don't want to talk on the air, especially if you have canning questions, um, call us at 667-3340 um, for more information about anything that we have talked about today. Um, it's time to think about uh, scouting for a banded sunflower moth in your sunflower uh, sunflower fields. IPM scouts are detecting increasing numbers of the banded sunflower moss in pheromone traps that are, um, are located throughout the state. Um, sunflower de crop development is in the vegetative growth to R3 in surveyed fields in North Dakota. Sunflowers should be scouted for banded sunflower moth eggs or adult moss when most most of the plants in the field are in, in the R3 or distinct bud elongated. And many of our fields and sunflowers, of course, are already blooming. So this may be a little bit too late for that. Uh, banded sunflower moth, just like the sunflower moth, causes similar damage where larvae tunnel through the seeds. Larvae may consume part or all of the contents of the developing seed and cause significant yield losses when populations are at the economic injury level. Um, sampling of sites should be at least 75 to 100 feet from the field margins. In a monitoring field, use the X pattern, um, counting moths on 20 plants per sampling site to obtain the total number of moths per 100 plants. Sampling should start in the late bud stage, early use usually during mid-July um, to continue through late, late flowering, um, the R5 to 7 stage. And so um, start scouting your fields and then also start scouting your fields for um, the seed weevil as well um, to see if you need to apply an insecticide. With harvest just around the corner, um, hopefully we'll get in the con get the combines out there very soon. I guess um, I had a couple calls yesterday about combining with a couple producers, and this is the latest I've ever remember since I've been an extension agent for 35 years that we haven't started combining, um, like before the county fair or like right after the county fair. And I guess I don't anticipate many people starting even this week yet, unless this hot weather is going to push things and dry things along. And so um, you still have time to prevent insect problems in grain bins. 
Oh, I thought you were going to tell them to take a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Hurry before it's harvest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get in the combine next week um, because it's going to be a late harvest, I got the feeling. And a lot of people like to be done before the kids go back to college or mm-hmm. back to school. That isn't going to so happen. Get that is that help. And yep. now the help's going to be in school. <laughs> yep. And that is not going to happen this year because um, I think that there's some schools that are starting on the 21st. Yes. yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. A lot of the rural schools. Will yep. Be. Yep. And, and I know that Bismarck's not starting until after Labor Day, but Mandan will be starting like around the 25th of August. So mm-hmm. hopefully you'll be able to get out in the field. Um, the key to good grain storage is anticipating and preventing potential problems through good bin management. Before treating with an insecticide protectant, make sure the bins are free of all insect-infested grain. So if there's leftover grain in there, you need to get it out of there, get it swept out, get it vacuumed up, and uh, make sure that um, the walls and all the seams are taken care of. Um, All grain handling equipment as well, augers, combines, trucks, and wagons should be thoroughly clean and grain residues removed before harvest. No, you that would be a good job for all those kids that yes. haven't gotten back to school yet. Yeah, I remember doing that. <laughs> I, I do, too. Like, and it usually was a hot day like today when I Always. had to go in the grain bin Clean and try and get it cleaned out. out. Yes. So make sure they have water and give them breaks. Yes. <laughs> so you could use a resi- residual ba- grain bins, uh, insecticides such as malathion, tempo, or a combination of com- chemicals can be applied to the interior bin surface um, two to three weeks before the new grain is placed in the bin. Well, we're getting kind of close to that, but you still would be able to kill any live insects that would be there. The treatment will kill insects emerging from their hiding places, cracks, crevices, underfloors, and in the aeration system. Um, Also, if possible, especially spray the joints, seams, cracks, ledges, and corners. Spray the ceiling, walls, and floors to the point of runoff. Use a coarse spray at a pressure of more of more than 30 pounds per square inch and aim for cracks and crevices. Spray beneath the bin, its supports, and a six-foot border around the outside foundation. Also make sure that that outside foundation is free of any weeds and um, grasses. Try and get it mowed so it's clean around there to prevent any insects from um, hiding in that area as well. The increased use of metal bins with perforated floors for grain drying and aeration has helped produce a serious insect problem in farm store grain. Grain dockage, broken kernels, grain dust, and chaff sifts through the floor perforations and collects in the subfloor, creating a new favorable environment for insect development. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the floors are usually difficult to remove, making inspection, cleaning, and insecticide spraying in that area um, almost impractical. The infested um, area may be disinfected with approved fumigant, such as chloropicrin or phostoxin if you want to go that far. And of course, you have to have a license to buy um, those two products. Also make sure that you read the label to make sure that the grain is labeled, um, that the insecticide you're using is labeled for that grain. There are some restrictions, especially with barley, that you can't use certain insecticides because especially if it's being used for malting barley, there's some concerns um, with certain insecticides that you cannot use. And so get those grain bins cleaned up because what happens is is that then we get the call that you need to get your fumigation license when there's bugs in the grain, and we don't want to have that either. Um, I've getting, been getting a few calls about dead circles in the lawn, um, and um, we were talking about that earlier, that it might be dogs. It could be a disease. Um, it's, it's kind of, there usually can be a dinner plate size or a crescent shape. Um, they in, There are patches of dead grass, usually 8 to 12 inches in diameter. They usually grow together, causing larger and larger areas of affected long, lawn. Um, the conditions that favor this is drought stress lawns, saturated or compacted soils, and then ex- excessive thatch buildup, which happens many times in many of these high maintenance Kentucky bluegrass lawns. Um, and so aeration is recommended, um, probably using less fertilizer um, because fertilizer and water and all this high maintenance that's done with lawns um, promotes in, uh, disease growth instead of retarding it. And so um, water 
um, for a longer period of time and less often is much better um, in lawn maintenance. Instead of watering that five to 10 minutes, make it 20 minutes and water. Uh, instead of every day, make it three times a week would be a much better thing. Um, and then try and do some aeration this fall yet. That, that can be done to help uh, reduce that thatch buildup. Um, you can purchase fungicides to help um, to prevent this. And as we just need to remember that a fungicide is a preventative. It's not a cure. And so once you have the disease in your lawn, the fungicide is not going to do you any good to spray it. It's going to, the fungicide would prevent it from getting um, worse in your lawn if you put it on early enough. Um, in a lawn where patch disease is diagnosed, aerating in both the spring and the fall may be necessary. Um, in addition, low nitrogen applications, even in the spring to minimize flush, fast, lush growth. Well, say that fast three <laughs> times uh, and I wouldn't be able to, will help disease, decrease a favorable disease climate. And so putting on that one pound per 10,000 square feet is the best way to um, use your um, your fertilizer application as as that um, as that at that rate. It's the other important control measure is to water two or three times a week. As I said, um, in the heat in the day when the weather is hot, greater than 85 degrees. This ensures that the grass is not drought stressed, since the thatch layer tends to dry out quickly. It is beneficial to cut the grass no shorter than three to three and a half inches in the heat of summer to shade the crowns and reduce stress. Um, dead patches sometimes will need to be reseeded. Need to remember that Kentucky bluegrass is a, um, uh, a rhizomatous grass, which means it spreads by its root system, and so sometimes it will fill in in those in those dead patches. But if need be, you might have to do some reseeding and um, check to make sure that if it's in a shady area, that if you need to buy new seed, get a shade tolerant grass rather than a sunny one if that's if, if that's an issue. Um, we're getting um, close to um, bison football season. Yeah. I just read on my <laughs> Facebook page, um, 18 days till mm -hmm. the first game in um, Ames. And so everybody is anxious to get that um, little program underway. Well, my daughter's heading, heading to NDSU this weekend to get started practicing for the Gold Star Marching Band, so she'll be there. Oh, yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, we'll see her every mm -hmm. time I go to a home game. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and of course, SDSU, where Ashley went to school, has a football team, too. And so they do? <laughs> Surprisingly. <laughs> Who knew? We do. Yeah. It's always a... Rebuilding. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, they have Mr. Zenner yet, so yep, yep. And he is great, so <laughs> it'll be fine. Um, we are about uh, ending our program for today, and we'll be back in two weeks with the Extension Connection with the agents from Morton County, and we will talk to you then. You've been listening to Extension Connection on Super Talk 1270. News and information from NDSU Extension Service and representatives of Morton and Burley County Extension offices. Tell your friends to listen in for the next Extension Connection exclusively here on Super Talk 1270. ABC News, Super Talk 1270. Accurate news, stimulating talk. This is KLXX AM, Mandan Bismarck.